How's it going everybody? My name is Liam and welcome back to the Liam's Plants channel. Today we are going to be doing another plant spotlight, taking a look at a very specific plant, going into the past experiences I've had with the plant, me and the plant's journey together, and then we'll cover some care tips, some information, and possibly look into the future. So the plant in front of me today is one of my absolute favorite plants. It is a carnivorous plant and actually the second plant I ever got when I moved to Chicago. So me and this plant have had quite a long journey. I think we are even past the one year mark moving into our two years together. So a little bit about the Cephalotus follicularis. This plant does originate in Australia. It is a pitcher plant, but it is one of the few pitcher plants that looks just a little bit different from the rest. <laughs> the Cephalotus does form in these sort of mounds of pitchers that you see here. These are all modified leaves which allow the plant to lure, capture, and digest its prey, which then gives nutrient to the plant, allowing it to continue growing. The Cephalotus follicularis does come in a nice green color, but given enough lighting, the traps do actually blush into this very deep maroony red, sometimes almost black and extreme enough lighting. Mine receives about 12 hours of light. We'll get into all the care information closer to the end of the video, but it has started producing this nice red color, which means that it is enjoying the lighting conditions it's in. So taking a look at this first picture here of the plant, this is on August 27th of 2021. So this is over a year ago from today. I got this plant online, ordered it from California carnivores, a very reputable carnivorous plant seller, and it arrived in beautiful condition. It was very, very tiny with just a few very almost microscopic pictures, but they did even have some nice red coloration there. Flash forward here to October 8th. This is when I took the next picture of this guy. Growth is not huge. This guy does not get large, but you can see that it is continuing to grow. New pictures are coming in, and it does seem pretty happy overall. The plant was really enjoying its conditions, it seemed to be doing its thing, it was it was growing. <laughs> so the next photo I've got here is on January 15th. Something pretty amazing was happening during that week. The plant was producing its first more mature pitcher. You can see that slightly larger pitcher, and you can mostly identify it based on all those little hairs that are coming off of it. The plant was finally enjoying its conditions enough to start really growing, and that's when I was really getting excited to see this guy get larger and larger, more defined, mature, established pitchers. However, since it was in dormancy during this period, it was getting reduced light down to six hours a day instead of 12. Because of that, the plant was just producing all green traps and leaves, which isn't a huge deal. The plant was in dormancy, but it was still growing, which is a good sign. So March 3rd is when things really started to hit the rockiest point and the scariest point in my journey with the cephalotus. So it did come out of dormancy around probably earlier in the previous month, and when carnivorous plants come out of dormancy, a lot of people like to replant them, give them fresh media, maybe a slightly larger pot to grow into for the next year. So it's pretty typical to refresh media for carnivorous plants, Venus flytraps, sundews, pings, all that stuff around the January through March months when they're starting to come out of their winter dormancy. However, cephalotus are known for being extremely, extremely picky and finicky. They do not like their environment changed at all. So I completely bare-rooted this plant. It did come in peat moss, and I was planning to transition it into sphagnum moss mixed with a sandier sort of pinguicula mix that would be great for this guy. So since it was in the peat moss, what I did was completely unroot it from the pot took all the soil, rinsed all the soil away from the roots, and then that is when I made a mistake. I guess the mistake is me taking it out of the pot, really, and messing with the roots. Uh, what I should have done was just taken that existing root ball and placed it into more media and surrounded that media. Instead of completely stripping all the media away from the roots, washing the roots, and putting it back into the new media. What this did was completely shocked the plant within the next two, three days all of the pitchers started browning up, crisping up, drying up, and dying. I was freaking out as this plant was, I mean, it was my second plant, but it had a lot of important value to me because of that. You can see in the photo that all of the growth is very yellow and sad and almost dead looking. 
it was very close to the brink of death. So the next photo I took here was on April 5th. This guy had been recovering from its transplant and I was really just trying to keep it in perfect conditions, be very careful with watering, make sure that it was having time to dry out in between waterings, and this guy did manage to pull through, which does just show the resilience of plants. The fact that this guy was on the brink of death and within two months is looking pretty much back to normal is pretty incredible to think about. So the traps had started to flush back into that red color given that they were back under normal lighting conditions, 12 hours a day, and I was just being very careful, like I said, to make sure it was in proper conditions, and it was doing okay. The recovery process was in process. July 17th is when this guy really started exploding and quickly became one of my favorite plants. I mean, let's think about those first pictures in that first picture I showed you guys. They were tiny, barely even noticeable, and by now, the plant is producing full normal sized mature pictures. They're very colorful, intricate, detailed. You can really see the expression of this plant coming through. And I was in love with it at this point. And it was just the beginning. That was the first huge full mature picture it made and the rest to come are gonna be exactly the same. So the last picture I took of it before the current day that we're in right now was on September 12th. It was flourishing, loving life absolutely incredible to look at. This guy was beautiful with reds throughout, so many large pictures. The mound of pictures had slowly, slowly been growing and growing, and it was really just starting to look like a nice established plant, something you'd actually run into in the wild. It was, it's staggering. I mean, it still is. It hasn't gotten any worse. By this time, I was really happy with the plant. It was amazing to see the recovery it had made from basically being on the brink of death, probably one or two days away from dying to making a full recovery within less than a year to being at the point that it's at now, looking this established, mature, and incredibly beautiful. Catching us up to the present here, this guy is doing great. He has continued to put out more and more pictures since the last photo I took and is just seemingly loving life. I mean, there's only so much I can say about a plant that is thriving. Some things that I have noticed, this plant is producing a lot of small pitchers. I believe those are separate growth points that the plant is pushing out, new basically growth, new vines. It's not a vining plant, but new growth, new stems, new new leaves. I don't know what to call it with this guy. So given that it is going into dormancy now, it still is under 12 hours of light, but within the next month I'm going to reduce that down to six. Along with the rest of my fly traps, they will all be entering their dormancy mode. I will not expect a whole lot of growth for them. We'll be resting, storing energy, and waiting for spring when better conditions arrive. So now that we've covered the journey that I've had with this plant, let's talk a little bit about my care information, maybe any suggestions or tips that I would have for you guys. So let's start out with lighting. Lighting is probably the most important factor for most carnivorous plants. I've talked about this before. A lot of carnivorous plants are similar to tomato plants in the way that they need light. Tomato plants need full, all-day, overhead sun outdoors to grow tomatoes. Cephalotus, Venus flytraps are the same way. In order to produce these full, mature pitchers, the plant does need 12 to 14 hours of light per day. Without that, you're just going to see the plant is producing those normal dormancy leaves, but it will not have enough energy to produce any traps. So my cephalotus are actually sitting under some grow lights right behind the camera. You may notice this background looks a little different than my other videos. I have actually flipped the camera because I felt the lighting was a little better for the plants this way. They weren't sitting in the shade so you can really see them, but yeah, that doesn't matter. So the lights are behind the camera, so they receive 12 hours of grow lights overhead. It's about probably six inches away from the plant, and then it's also in a southern facing windowsill, so it's getting blasted by southern light all day. Next on the care list would probably be water. This is again very similar for a lot of carnivorous plants. The Cephalotus follicularis does not like minerals. It doesn't like minerals in its soil, and it definitely doesn't like minerals in its water. So you are kind of limited down to a few types of water, anything that sits in that below 100 parts per million range. I'll simplify it for you. Distilled water, reverse osmosis, or rainwater. Those are going to be your three easiest options for watering a cephalotus. 
but let's now talk about watering frequency. So we know what to water it with, but how frequently do we want to water it? This is something that took a little bit of experimenting and learning. A lot of carnivorous plants are bog plants, so it's actually okay with Venus flytraps and pings to leave them, and sundews and such, to leave them sitting in water. They actually like that. They will just absorb the, the, the sphagnum moss will absorb the water as it needs it, and the plant will always be in moist substrate. However, the Cephalotus follicularis is from Australia. Australia is not a bog, so these guys actually prefer to be on the drier side than any carnivorous plant I've experienced. This pot is actually pretty much completely dry. It's going to be in need of water in the next couple days, but it does usually dry out completely between waterings. The best way for me to identify that it's completely watered, first off, the weight. The pot will feel significantly lighter, but I also like to look at the bottom drainage. If the bottom drainage is dry, it's a very good sign that the rest of the pot is dry because that's the last part of the media that will dry out. So I'll usually feel the sphagnum moss through the drainage holes. If it feels very dry and crispy, then it's definitely time to water. But if it's still super damp, moist, then the plant is still totally fine. So last on the care list for this guy would be soil, probably the trickiest, but there is some lenience in it. So I'll sort of give my solution, but it's not the solution. So these guys can grow in many different carnivorous plant substrates. Uh, I personally have mine in a mix of 50% sphagnum moss and 50% pinguicula mix, which is already made. So it's a mix of several additives, perlite, pumice, some sand. It's just a very sandy mix. So I take the sandy mix, mix it with some sphagnum moss, which can retain some moisture, and then I've got my medium for this guy. It has seemed to love it. It has had no issues. I picked sand because it allows for very quick free draining and gives the plant a bit more weight to the pot so it does stay nice and stable. However, I would imagine you could have success growing this in a 50-50 perlite peat moss mix. You could probably even grow it in full sphagnum moss if you wanted to, but you'd have to be very, very careful with watering. So there is no one size fits all for soil medium. It's kind of just what works best for your environment. If you're growing outdoors, you're probably going to want something that can retain a bit more moisture. If you're growing indoors, you're probably going to want something that dries out a bit quicker. So really get a feel for your environment and make your decision based on that. Fertilization is probably the last thing on my care list for this guy. I do fertilize most of my carnivorous plants on a monthly basis. The cephalotus is included with that bunch. So what I'll do is take a diluted mixture of maxi, which is essentially what you would give to fish. I dilute that in some distilled water, and then I will spray that into the pitchers every month, which gives it some nutrients. And then I'll also take a couple dehydrated bloodworms. Yeah, it's a little gross, but plants eat, these plants eat bugs, then they, they need the nutrients. I'll take some dehydrated bloodworms, again, something you'd probably feed to fish. I'll rehydrate them with a little bit of distilled water and place them, a couple of them, inside the pitchers. Doing this has really given this plant a ton of nutrients and energy and probably contributes to why it's succeeding so much this year. As we move into the dormancy period, I will cut off fertilization completely until we make it back into spring. So this month will be the last month that this guy gets fertilized, and then it will be just in dormancy mode until the spring. Now, speaking of dormancy, that is something that a lot of people don't really have a complete, definite answer on. These plants can take dormancy, but I've also seen people completely have success without dormancy. So it's a little bit like the plant can do it, but it doesn't need it. A lot of tropical carnivorous plants like sundews, they do not need any dormancy. However, fly traps without a dormancy will die. So it's kind of this like, I don't know if it needs it but I can't tell if it wants it. So I think it's benefiting the plant, but I don't think the plant needs it. It's giving the plant some time to store nutrients, relax a little bit, take a couple months off growing, and just store nutrients, work on building a root system, anchoring itself into the ground, and then when spring comes, it can focus on throwing out some beautiful traps. 
So I have given my plant dormancy. I did give it dormancy last year, and it emerged in the spring with vigor, a lot of vigor, and was ready to grow. Besides the setback of me putting it into the wrong medium. We'll, we'll not think about that too much. But I am planning on putting it into dormancy this year, so it will be going back dormant and will hopefully re-emerge in the spring We'll see together if it does, but that about does it. This video is getting extremely long, but some of these spotlights where I have a lot of history with the plant will probably be on the longer side. But thank you guys so much for watching. I really hope you guys enjoyed. The Cephalotus is just an amazing, rewarding plant. If you're trying to get into carnivorous plants, definitely think about it. It is a little tricky, but once you get the hang of it, it's not too hard at all. Other than that, I hope you guys have a wonderful week. Hopefully your plant plants get blasted by some sun, and I'll see you all in the next video. Take care, bye bye